Amen. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that you have provided for us. Today we ask that the Spirit of God touches each and every one of us. We pray for the Duvall family and the loss of Kathy. We thank you for her dedication and her love for the church. We pray for those who are sick. We ask that you'll continue to lay your healing hand upon those in our church that we've been praying for. We thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, that we're beginning to move around, taking care of some of the things to get the community involved with our church and to get the members out doing things that are safe but always remembering the thanks that we give to you because of the greatest gift that you have given to us, and that is your Son, who died for each and every one of our sins. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to start out by preaching a sermon to you today. Um, actually, it's about Job, but I'm only going to get past one scripture, the very first verse in the very first chapter of Job. Because that passage of scripture has affected the lives of so many individuals. And I read it and I read it and read it. I thought, how can people, I, don't, I didn't understand what the problem was. But let me read the scripture and we'll take it from there and then we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get started here. It's in the book of Job chapter 1 verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and that he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and abstained from evil. When I read the scripture during the research, I found that people became upset with that verse of scripture. I looked at it, I searched it, I thought, I, I can't imagine why anybody would be upset with that. But I'm going to share why they were upset with it, and then maybe you'll get a better understanding how important Bible study really is and, and researching the scripture is. The book of Job is a, a book that uh, involves a man's life who was a farmer. And his name was Job. And God blessed him with a lot of wealth and a lot of friends, a lot of family. And uh, he was a good man. He, the Bible says he was a perfect man. Uh, the book of Job is one of six books identified in our Christian Bible as being the books of poetry and wisdom. So what I want you to do this morning is I want to ask you this question. I want you to pretend for just a moment that you are a farmer and that God has blessed you with everything that you've ever wanted, plenty of money, great family, everything's going perfect in your life. So think about that for a moment or two while I go on and give you some more historical uh, information about the book of Job. Uh, there are some people who believe that the powerful words found in Job is one of the greatest literature uh, writings of all time. I thought, well, okay, we can agree with that. But I'm sure that if they're looking at the Bible, that they may see things differently. But it's the content of the, the, the book itself. And the book itself deals with one very important issue that all of us have even today, and that is sorrow and also the sovereignty of God. So the, the, the big thing in the book of Job is how he is going to be faithful to God no matter what happens to him as a person. He will be faithful to God. Now, we don't know who the writer of Job was, and we don't know the date in which the book was written. Now, you will find, if you research, there's going to be a lot of people with a lot of opinions. So remember that what we're looking at here is the best possible information that I could get to you. And this is to be true and accurate, the best that I can understand. And I think when we get back to that scripture, there may be some of you that say, well, I don't agree with what this one says or that one says or what you're telling us this morning. You have to make the decision after the explanation about why such a scripture in such a very popular book has caused people to pack up and leave a church. And, and it was amazing when, when the research was done. There are two main issues that we look at in the book of Job, and that is the problem with suffering and, as I said, the sovereignty of God. There's not a person in this church that has not suffered something in their life whether it is a death, loss of a job, the virus. Now we're listening on the news and the virus is returning back in, in some of these uh, states. 
And people are saying, maybe we have moved too fast. So these are things that upset us. And there's a lot of sorrow in that because I think people will look back eventually and they'll say, we did this too early, we did this too late, or we didn't do this, or we didn't do something else. And that's going to bring some sorrow uh, about it. Remember last week I told you uh, the Bible says about having knowledge. Knowledge can bring about sorrow. Today, when we listen to the scriptures, when we start reading and understanding where Job came from, you're going to learn a number of things. A good man, a perfect man according to the scriptures, a man who, who did not sin, a man who, who had a great reputation, and all of this came to an abrupt ending. And the ending was that he would lose everything that he held dear to him. All the things that he had acquired over life will be gone. And it will be because a decision had to be made. And that was simply he, as the person we're speaking of being Job, he had to prove his loyalty to God. Now, when we read that scripture, a lot of times people will say, well, the book is about patience. And it is. It's about patience. It's not about him being an, an upright man. It's not about him being a perfect man. It's not about the things that he didn't do. It's about getting patience. You will find that in this particular story that Job was a very patient man as all these things came to him. And I, I often think to myself, would we be as strong as Job if we lost everything that we had? Sometimes we have to realize that it's the, the suffering that can pull us apart from family and friends. But yet God has a, a definite uh, concern about people and their suffering. God wants to help, but sometimes we don't want God's help. We, we shut God out. We, we simply go on and we want to carry the burden by ourselves and whatever it may be. Why do innocent people suffer? I've had people ask me that question time and time again. This particular book of the Bible will tell you because of a man's faith in God, he was able to get through those trying and difficult times. Many of us today don't realize how important this book is. God cares for us no matter what kind of suffering we're going through, no matter what it is that we're doing. It could be uh, the students going back to school and, and the classroom being too small or too large. Anything that's suffering, God cares about. He especially cares for his children when they're suffering. But we have to be patient because God will help us in our time of need if we are patient and wait patiently on God. So what does the name Job mean? It means he that weeps and cries. And as you hear this story of this man and all that he lost and how he lost it, you will probably say, how could he even endure uh, such a thing that went on in his life? Because when I say he lost everything, he lost his kids, he lost his, his personal belongings, he lost his wealth, he lost everything. And as you read this, you're saying to yourself, why would God permit that? And the answer is going to come up that's going to really surprise you too. A man who had a lot of wealth and happiness, and the time came that on a certain day, all that was going to change. I believe in my heart that as we journey this pathway of life and some event that happens, we'll say can be one of the tragic events that you had in your life, is that that's the day your life begins to change. And when I say your life begins to change, it changes when somebody dies. It changes when somebody is affected by, by something that somebody else does. It changes us the way we think and the way we act. Everything that Job had, he lost. Wealth, livestock, his friends even, even turned on him because they kept asking him the question, what did you do? What did you do that made God come down on you so hard? Tell us what it was. His wife, uh, she was another that, that began to think, what did my husband do? And this went on day after day and week after week as we begin to see these things. But the thing that impressed me the most about the research was how his health could have very easily caused him to turn from God. It went into great detail as I was researching about the things that he had to endure 
because of him being faithful to God. And sometimes in our lives, there are things that we have to endure. We have to try to do the best we can to work ourselves through the things. Remember last week, walking through the fire, not in it. And many of us need to remember that as these days go by, because there's a lot of things in the world today that are changing, and the Christian is one. Sometimes we don't realize what is ahead of us. Job did not realize, and this is one of the things, that one of the challenges in this particular book was that Job was dealing with his friends and trying to convince them that he did nothing. They didn't believe him. On the other hand, God was dealing with Satan. Because if you read the scriptures, you're going to find that God says, what about my faithful friend Job? That's what he said to Satan. Satan then returned in the conversation, and you'll read this, where he knew everything about Job. So if God knew Job's name, and Satan knew Job's name, I can almost guarantee you he knows your name. God and Satan know your name. When it was brought up, Satan says, well, you got this, this hedge about him. You're protecting him. So Satan has the information that's out there on Job as he has it on each and every one of you. And whatever it is that will cause you to drift from God, Satan knows what it is. God knows what it is. But here's the question. I wonder if you had to go through what Job went through and lose everything that you have, including your health, at what point you would just throw the flag in and say, I'm going to give up. I'm going to denounce God. Many of us could not live the life that Job lived and be as patient as he was with God. You see, the book is about patience. Patience, dealing with your sorrow. Patience, dealing with the, your friends that come against you. Patience that other people don't understand. They want to know why something happened, and Job simply held his ground because he knew and loved God with great compassion. So when we ask ourselves this question, would God have the same confidence in us if we started losing things? Only you can answer that. And I think that most of us would say, well, there's probably at a breaking point for us, and I think the loss of a child is one of the worst things that we could go through. But he lost all of his children, all of them. Everything that he held dear to, he lost. And we are now beginning to understand what great sorrow this man. We have to appreciate the fact that in order to learn about the integrity of Job, we have got to learn about his great suffering. Because sometimes we don't really understand what a person is going through until we walk a mile in their shoes. We don't understand that. And I've often said to, to people who, who've lost children, those who have never lost a child will never know what you're going through. And here's another. If you have never been divorced, you'll never know what divorce is like unless you've experienced it or you've lost a best friend or whatever the case may be because we just get up every day and assume that every day will be filled with sunshine and everything is going to go well. And it has for most of you up to this point. What about this afternoon or what about this evening? The first two chapters is the great controversy uh, between Job and his friends and God and Satan. And in the, the scripture, uh, we want to look at it again. So here's where the problem begins, where people got into this big tiff about the scripture. And it went like wildfire. And this is why some of the people left the church after reading chapter 1, verse 1. For there was a man whose name was Job, and he was perfect and upright and uh, feared God and abstained from evil. What possibly could we pick from that passage of Scripture that would cause people to leave a church? Here's the man who instigated the problem. His book is on Amazon. His name is Dan Barker, and he wrote the book Losing Faith in Faith, from a pastor to an atheist. That scripture caused him to write that book. I thought, how could it be? What is his problem? And, and I didn't understand what his problem was. And you don't understand until you follow me with the uh, events. It seems that Pastor Barker uh, had a problem with the scripture. 
after he read Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He then comes and openly announces to the people that there is a controversy in the scripture. He is now referring to where Job was a perfect man. And that bothered him. And that bothers a lot of people. But I do believe after researching, you will understand why that terminology was used as Job being a perfect man. Now, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't misreading something. So I wanted to go to the Hebrew Bible, which I do many times, and I wanted to read the same scripture. It reads exactly alike with the exception the word perfect is not there, but it is using the word blameless. But it's the same thing. If somebody is blameless, they're maybe not perfect, but they're pretty close to that. So as he's gathering this information, his responsibility certainly should be to the church and say, I'm now an atheist because I don't believe in the scripture. How many people turn away? We don't know. But it's been out there. He, and if you get a chance, go on Amazon and look up the book. It's got his picture right there. And it's a book that he wrote about when faith let him down and he became, became an atheist because of that particular passage of scripture. What is it that causes people to walk away from the church? Not much on this particular person. However, we do understand that he was looking for answers and couldn't find them. He insisted, and when he preached to the people, that why would God say that you had to be perfect when he knows you can't be perfect? I thought, well, he's got a point there. Because I remember in times in my life that I would often say, you know... God's got such a rigid requirement for us, it's hard for us to live by that. Well, was I wrong? And I'm going to prove to you how wrong many of us have been by simply misreading a scripture and putting ourselves in front of the problem and then saying to ourselves, were we right? And in this particular case, the pastor wasn't really correct in what he said. So I looked up the word perfect in the dictionary. It says that it is without fault or defect. Kind of like your marriage is perfect. Right? Or is there a problem with that? Perfect relationship. Everything was perfect in your life. Your spouse, your children, your work, your neighbors, perfect. But you know, yeah, that's right. there you go. Uh, and now you hear a couple of amens from some other women, yes and no, whatever. But nothing is perfect except God. So, when we look at the scriptures, the scripture of Job is about patience. With patience, you endure the imperfect things that go on in and around your lives. In and around them. Sometimes when we look at things, we say to ourselves, I want to be this Christian and I have to live a life that's pleasing to God. Now, I haven't even gotten out of the first verse, but I want to go back to the New Testament again and read another scripture for you. It says, thou shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. You shall be perfect. Ever stop and listen to a, a, a child when you tell the child you've got to do A, B, and C? God has referred to Scripture time and time, the words you have to be or you shall be or you will be perfect. I'm afraid to say that we've misunderstood that, and I'll give you the reason why based upon what I found. Because when we say that we're perfect, that means that there's no flaw in us. But listen, the pastor that left the church he said he left because they said Job was perfect. Whoever wrote it, they put down he was perfect. Was he perfect? Or did we miss something in the translation? Are we perfect when we look at Matthew 5, 48? Or are we missing something in the translation? When does Job become perfect? When he comes or becomes complete. When he dies and is with the Lord. Then he becomes perfect. So the scripture that read simply, he was perfect, that is now correct. He was perfect after death. Sin stops then. Now, when we go ahead and we look at the scripture, we realize that God would not deliberately say to us, you have to be perfect, like my father is in heaven. 
We're not going to sit back and simply say that we agree that on earth we've got to be as good as we'll be in heaven because that's not going to happen. But we do know this. When we also become complete, we then will be in that perfect relationship with God. And as we look at that, we say to ourselves, now I'm beginning to understand. So does the reality of the word perfect simply mean when you become complete? The reason I'm saying that to you is this. People left the church because they simply said, the pastor told me that Job was not perfect. But he was. He just wasn't complete. You see, if you just add a little more to something and understand what God is trying to say, the Christian life is not hard for you to, to, to do. You just have to do what God requires you to do. You're not going to be perfect in everything that you do. Complete. Everything involves looking at words and saying to yourself, if I'm thinking this way, what is somebody else thinking? So I would beg you to start looking at Scripture and to say to yourself, I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to be the kind of Christian that God wants me to be. Be sure of what you're reading. Explore other words that perhaps have the same meaning, like shall, okay? I found out that shall simply meant in the future. Here's some scripture. Revelation 9, 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Shall. Revelation 18, 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And thirdly, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented a day and night forevermore. That is also completion. You see, we stop too soon. You ever ask anybody, I've had people say this, Bible says it's okay for me to drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Okay, you may want to read on. Because it says, Woe be to him that waketh up in the morning with bruises and does not know how he got them. Woe be to him who wakes up in the morning whose eyes are red and he doesn't know why. So don't stop in one place. Go as far as you can. If you are trying to get answers from God, you've got to be patient. Your health may not be good, but it can be a whole lot worse. You may not have the knowledge that you think that you should have. You have to study to show thyself approved by God. You have to want a desire to understand what it is that you're reading. The book of Job is a great book. It would make a great book on TV. People could see what the sorrow really is. And you say to yourself, man, I didn't know it was that bad for that man. Just when you think it can't get any worse, it got worse for Job. Job was a godly man. Now we're moving into the end of verse 1, which I'll have to stop at that, but we're going to move into it. So he was a godly man. Let's give him credit for that. Godly man. A godly man is someone who is deeply religious and shows obedience uh, to the rules and the regulations of the religion, whatever that religion is. It is important for you to be obedient to God, to do what God wants you to do. God does not want his children to go around in this state of sadness and sorrow without any hope. But there is hope. But you have to want to use that hope. You have to want to have God to say, Lord, I know this has been a long, long road for me, but I'm going to patiently wait. Do you know, I think it's chapter 1, verse 22, and I've not got there yet, but I believe it says that through all that Job went through, not one time did he complain to God. Not one time. And when you read his medical records, you say to yourself, my goodness gracious, what pain this man must have been in. And, and added to, he lost all of his personal belongings. Added to, his friends were telling him that, that he did something wrong. Added to, the loss of his children. And you say to yourself, where's the breaking point? He didn't have one. Because the sermon is about you having patience with everybody in your life. Every individual person that may bring heartache, that has already brought heartache, or something that you may not understand. Be patient. God will work with you. But stop walking again around the fire. Start walking through it. Now, what is a godly man? 
the godly man I just described to you also is a person who has a heart of worship and reverence toward God in any denomination. When we come into God's house, there is a reverence that we need to present to God. And that is we are here for worshiping. For not, nothing else other than worship. And years ago, when, when the churches gathered, they would sing a song. They would uh, read some scripture. And they were there for the afternoon. Morning and afternoon, many of them, because church was a big part of their lives. Fire. Your relationship with God is, is, is in writing. God promises you that he has given to you an eternal home. The doubts about that come from your own mind, not from your heart. You know that to be true. And you know to be true also, you have to be patient and listen to what God says. Yes, some of you have medical issues, and I do understand that. Yes, some of you have financial issues, and I do understand that. And yes, some of you have lost people, I even understand that. But combining all of those together, take one thing away from the sermon today. Be faithful to God and he will work with you. Let us bow in a word of closing prayer, please. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we ask that the Spirit of God be felt here. Are we here, Lord, for the purpose of worshiping? Today, as we only read one scripture, we begin to understand we can lose the, the understanding of a word by a word where it's put in and how it's said, and so many can be offended by it. But the reality, Lord, is that you are our God, and we are here to serve you. The question should go to you for guidance and help and understanding. Bless those who have left the church because of some misunderstanding about your word, that somewhere along the line they may come to know Christ in a, in a better way and find themselves back in a Bible-believing church. Forgive us, Lord. We thank you for this day. Watch over us and keep us from harm, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.